What's up? What's up, everybody? Michael Johnson here with the Business Choreography Podcast. I'm excited you join me today because we have a very, very special guest today. We are so lucky and privileged to have John Morris on the show. He is the founder and CEO of Ramsey Innovations and a serial entrepreneur prior to Ramsey. He established Rise Interactive in 2004. Over the next 16 years, he grew Rise from a one-person shop to one of the largest independent marketing agencies in the world. After selling Rise, John pondered his next move and realized that he was most energized when connecting and helping fellow entrepreneurs grow their business. And that is why he's here today to help us do that specific thing. I'm excited to glean all the wisdom, knowledge, and expertise from him today. So stick around, let's cue the intro, and we'll jump right in. Listen, there's a lot to learn when growing and scaling your business. That's why we created the Business Choreography Podcast, where we talk about choreographing your marketing, operations, and sales into dynamic systems that increase your revenue and your impact. We'll explore solid business principles and discuss all things that make businesses dance to success with clarity. We'll help you figure out where the holes are in your business and what you can do to fix them. Think of us as your official business choreographers, aka your insider growth strategists. Remember, your choreography matters. Welcome to the Business Choreography Podcast. John, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. It is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Michael, thanks so much. Really excited to be here. Awesome. It, uh, it's never a straight line, always <laughs> a crazy winding road, and I'm excited to share your journey and how you got to here doing the incredible things that you're doing. So we've got to jump right in, dig into the backstory a little bit. Tell us about your journey to get to this point. Sure. So I've actually been in the marketing space for pretty much my entire adult career. So from the mid 1990s to 2020, I was in the agency space. Uh, I went to business school to actually get out of the agency space and entered an annual business plan competition at University of Chicago called the New Venture Challenge. Uh, took second place on that, and that brought me right back into the marketing space. So I was not able to leave. And uh, when I started Rise, um, first thing is my goal was to create a great business. So a lot of people talked about like, what's your exit strategy? Are you going to go get money and be out in five years? And, you know, my exit strategy originally was I was going to die one day. And <laughs> right. uh, I obviously ended up selling it. But uh, I, I think that's just a really important thing for people to understand that, you know, don't worry about the exit. The exit will take care of itself. Just focus on building a great business. So what Rise did is we helped generally enterprise organizations with their digital media, their web development services, and their analytics. And our key differentiator really came from the insights that we were able to glean. Uh, we built uh, an eight-figure uh, analytics platform that was allowing you to identify waste and redeploy that waste in a much more efficient, more effective area. Um, and so it was an amazing journey. Uh, and it actually, you know, dovetail well to what I'm doing now. Uh, I, I don't know if I would start this business as early as I wanted to, uh, but I sold it and stepped down as the CEO in April of 2020. And I had three young kids, a six, eight and 10 year old at that time period. Uh, there's no travel, there's no golf courses, and we are wiping down our groceries because we didn't know if we could eat them safely at that moment in time. Right. So uh, it's just a crazy time period. But uh, what led me to the idea of what we're doing with Ramsey was uh, we followed, and I don't know if your audience will be familiar with it, I think a lot will, a lot won't, but a, a methodology for running your business called EOS. And it's basically a great book by Gina Wickman called Traction, gives you all the guidelines of how to follow it. We had an EOS implementer and every three months I would meet with him and every three months he was like, I am blown away by your financials. I'm blown away by the insights that you guys are able to have. It's like, it's a business within itself. And so that was the impetus to building budgeting and forecasting software for professional service firms. But what I want people to understand is uh, I don't care what industry you're in, you have tons and tons of competition. And when you have tons and tons of competition, how you spend your time and how you spend your money 
relative to how they spend their time and how they spend their money is really going to determine if you're grabbing market share, if you're not grabbing market share. And when it comes to budgeting, this is what we did at Rise from the very beginning. Like when I was a one person shop, we had a really sophisticated budget put together that really focused on how do we spend our time and our money as intelligently as possible. Uh, and one of the key metrics that I constantly looked at was what percent of my revenue do I spend on sales and marketing? And uh, doesn't mean you're going to spend it well, but if you spend more on your sales and marketing as a percent of revenue than anyone else, then you have a greater chance of growing relative to companies the same size as you. And so that became a big part of our philosophy. Uh, we also focused very heavily on gross margin because if you could improve gross margin, that would give you more money to spend on sales and marketing. And then the last one is I thought of ourselves as a private equity company and a typical agency should make about 20% of its revenue in EBITDA, which is a fancy word for profit. I focus on a much lower target, generally around 5%, which gave us once again, more money for sales and marketing. And so I had a growth mindset. I had a long-term horizon. Uh, and I focused on a couple of key metrics that really helped us scale and improve the area that we were looking to grow in. Wow. What a, what a crazy, was it, what a crazy road <laughs> to get to that yeah. point. Uh, and, and the fact that you got out in 2020, would I, was it before the pandemic or was it so like on March? So I, I finalized the deal in January. I was on an earnout for a couple of years, but I, I my earnout ended. I, I told the parent company Quad, which is a beyond amazing company, the company that acquired us, uh, that I would be stepping down. I told my whole company on March second. On March second, we had no idea that the world was about to close. Wow. On March twelfth, we went to work from home. And then on April 1st, the new CEO took over. And so, wow. you know, it, there's no way I could have predicted, you know, uh, that that's what the world was about to change to. Wow. What great timing for you. You know, it was, but also as a leader, you want to be there during the tough times. But what I will say is the current CEO was absolutely the right person for the job. He did right. such an amazing job of building a calm and a level of stability and really making everyone feel safe in a right. very unsafe time. Right. Right. Wow. That's crazy. Now you, you talked a lot about these three things, spending more on sales and marketing, uh, gross margin and private equity. I want to dig just a little bit into each of those because I know that uh, for those listening to the show that uh that that's that those things stood out to them they're going to want to hear more about those things so yep. this idea of spending more on sales and marketing now i i have a a marketing background as well and i always find that there's a lot of people that are like what are you talking about <laughs> like are you crazy yeah. <laughs> and so i want you to dig into that a little bit more and help help everybody understand that concept and that idea yeah. So first of all, I want to say it's spending more in sales and marketing as a ratio to revenue. So it's, you know, if your revenue is a million dollars, I'm not expecting you to spend $2 million. You know, now right. I speak in professional service terms. Uh, a professional service agency typically spends 8% of their revenue on sales and marketing. We were spending close to 15%. So almost double wow. what the typical agency spends. And, you know, if, if you think about it, you don't want to be the best kept secret. Right. You know, dating myself, you know, but if you think about beta versus VHS, right? Uh, VHS was an inferior product, right. but it outmarketed beta. Right. Uh, this is actually, I learned this in business school. The QWERTY keyboard, which is the keyboard we use today, was right. an inferior keyboard. There were two keyboards that were out at the exact same time. Yes. And they outmarketed a better product. Right. And so, the whole idea is that if you know who your target audience is, you know how to reach them, you invest in getting the, you know, eyeballs to your website, eyeballs to, you know, any events you do, chances to talk to them, 
you know, you're going to have a competitive advantage to companies that don't. It's really funny, but eight marketing agencies typically don't spend a lot of money on sales and marketing. And I, I used to make this as a joke, but I was like, how come I'm the only marketer that actually believes in marketing? You know, <laughs> you would think that everyone would be doing it. Right. Uh, but a lot of them don't. And so, um, you know, but, and, and by the way, it really depends on who you are and what you want to do. So uh, my very first like big hire was a guy named Scott Conine at Rise. And he applied for an account manager position. And at this point, I'm working out of my 1300 square foot condo uh, in the city of Chicago. He's interviewing in this tiny little office in my house. There's nobody, you know, I had one other employee and he asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to create the world's largest independent digital agency. So I have very clear vision that I wanted to create something large from the beginning. Now, uh, I have a client of mine that does 5.1 million in revenue and said his goal is to get to 6 million and never wants to be larger. So sales and marketing is probably not a big a deal for that person as it was for me. Right. Uh, and so, you know, understanding, do you want to create a large organization? Do you want to create a lifestyle organization? Uh, I think is a really important thing that people just need to think about. What I always explain is that there's no wrong answer. You know, that uh, your strategy will differ. The way you spend your time and money will differ. Uh, but, you know, you have to really do some soul searching of who you want to be and what you want to do. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, in a beautiful approach. I mean, it's, it's, it is crazy how many people that do marketing don't actually spend on marketing. <laughs> yeah. Now, I also want to point something out. Just because you spend money on sales and marketing doesn't mean that you spend it intelligently. Right. And uh, one of my favorite stories is we were spending about a million dollars in sales and marketing. And we would generally add about six million dollars in incremental revenue. So one year I went from spending a million dollars to spending two million dollars in sales and marketing, and I generated six million dollars in incremental revenue. Right. It had no impact that second one million dollars. Right. And so what I always tell people is, you know, think of the bets you want to make and do it in a much more incremental way. Right. You know, so we started going, you know, rather than from one to two, go, let's go from one to 1.1. 1 .1 and right. let's do some tests. And when you identify the next thing, then you look to scale it and grow it from there. Awesome. I love that. The next thing you'd mentioned was talking a little bit about gross margin and how that impacted. Uh, and, and I want you to dig into that just a little bit more for us. Absolutely. I'm going to speak in professional service terms because that's the world I know, but it really sure. applies to all businesses. Right, right. Uh, so in the professional service world, we sell time. And those time are, are people. And 99% of small agencies or small professional service firms that I speak to do not know how to calculate your gross margin. So the first thing is I'm just going to give a few definitions. You have... Uh, your net revenue. I use the word net because a lot of people will have pass through. Like if you have media or anything that is not really part of your revenue, you don't get to count that. It's only your real revenue. Right. And then in, in the professional service world, it's your payroll, your contractors that only relate to doing client work, your technology, your travel and entertainment, any client gifts, anything that relates to doing client work is what we call cost of service. If you're selling widgets, it would be your cogs, you know, so it'd be, I bought a pencil for a uh, dollar and I sold it for $3. Um, and that revenue minus your cost of service or your cogs equals your gross margin. Now in the professional service world, if your gross margin is above 50%, you are going to be profitable and you can invest in your business. If it is between 40 and 50%, you will either be profitable or you will invest in your business, but you will not have enough money to do both. Right. And then lastly, if it is below 40%, you will be losing money. Right. 
And so um, just understand that framework. I have something called Project 60%, and we really focus on automating, near shore development. How do we ensure that the quality of work still stays the same, but gets us towards a 60% gross margin? And so, um, so that was a big focus to who we are and what we wanted to do, you know, in that regard. Right. I love that. All right. And lastly, before we move on to some other stuff is just, let's dig in a little bit more to the private equity side, because I think for a lot of people hearing that might be like, wait, what are you talking about? Private equity. Yeah. I knew, maybe they know about the other two, but this might be a, a space where they're a little like, hmm, what do you mean? <laughs> so typically private equity is thought about as going to, you know, some investor, whether it's an angel investor, an institutional investor, and they put money into your business. Right. You give up ownership. Right. Uh, my approach was different. My approach was I'm going to give up profits. And rather than having 20% of my revenue go into my pocket, I'm going to only have 5% of my revenue go into my pocket. So that 15% was money that I could have kept. I could have put in my bank account. Right. But I thought that there were good investments for us to make. And because there were good investments to make, um, I chose to forego profits in the short run so that I, I could continually feel the growth of the business. Right. Makes sense. I love that. Let's dig into a little bit more about Ramsey and yeah. um, and help us to understand a little bit more about what that's about and what you're creating and building in that space. So I just gave you a whole bunch of numbers. I talked about you know year over year revenue growth. I've talked about profits, and uh, what I've learned is that there's a lot of really cool nuance to the professional service space. So. Um, the first thing is going back to just just the agencies, just marketing agencies. There's 120,000 of them just in the United States. There are twice as many architects as there are marketing agencies. Right. What that means is that I don't really care what type of agency you have or what type of architectural firm or what type of law firm you are. There are thousands, if not tens of thousands of companies that you compete with on a regular basis. Right. And so what we've built is budgeting forecasting software that is unique to that industry and that vertical that helps you think about you know what your hiring schedule should be and what your margin should be and all those things but i can really distill it down to three areas we want to help companies improve their year-over-year -year revenue growth we want to help companies increase their profit as a percent of their revenue and the third thing is we want to increase their cash as a ratio to their monthly overhead. Now, in each one of those three areas, uh, there's not that many insights you need to worry about. So like, let's just use your over year revenue growth. Uh, that either is going to come from winning new business, renewing your existing customers or upselling, um, upselling, you know, your existing customers. Sure. And what we want to do is give you benchmark data to understand how good of a job you are doing. You know, so the first thing is if you're a professional service firm, we want you to grow top line revenue by 20% on a year over year basis. If you are below 20%, it's either because you're not good at winning new business, not good at keeping your business or not good at upsell. And so the idea is to help you understand where are the warning areas, where should you focus your time so that you can improve better in that area. On the profit side, it's either your gross margin, which should be 50%, or your SG&A, which is anything, any expenses that are not related to doing client work, should be 30%. And then in SG&A, there's actually only four buckets, sales and marketing, executive, R&D, and your operations and finance. And there's benchmarks for each one of those. So let's just say you're not at 30%, it, you know, you're let's just say 50%, you're spending way too much on your SG&A. Well, I already told you that sales and marketing is typically 8%. Operations and finance is 15%. R&D, almost no one spends money on R&D. It's another interesting area of opportunity. Uh, and so your executive team is 7%. So you can see like, oh, I'm spending 15% of my executive team and everyone else is spending 7%. 
I am probably overpaying my team relative to the size of my business. Right. And so those are the key insights that we try to help people understand. I love that. So talk to me a little bit more about what it's, what it's like to use that. And it sounds like it could be super complicated and potentially overwhelming. So help, help us get over that hump because it's certainly stuff that is absolutely necessary. Okay. So first of all, uh, that's exactly what we're trying to avoid is the overwhelming and what do you avoid? There are three numbers you need to know. You need to know your year over year revenue growth. You need to know your profit as a percentage of revenue. And you need to know your cash relative to your monthly overhead. Okay, th that's it, three numbers. Now, I'm just gonna use the profit one as an example, and I'll show you how you, you dig in deeper. Uh, but once again, we try to keep it simple. 50% is the target for your gross margin. Let's just say you had a 43% gross margin. Well, you know you're below the number, right? You wanted to be at 50%, you're at 43. So a natural question to ask would be why? So what you now want to do is look at your gross margin by line of business. Uh, let's just say you have a web development practice and a paid media practice. And your paid media practice is at a 50% gross margin and your web development is at a 33% gross margin. Well, now you know where you need to focus your time. I have a problem on my web development and so I'm going to go spend time thinking about, do I have a pricing problem? Do I have too many senior people? Do I not have enough direct reports per manager? Can I nearshore or offshore anything? Can I automate something? But now all of a sudden, as a business owner, you can, you know, we just saved you tons of time because you know exactly where to focus your time to fix your problem. Right. And same thing where, you know, you, you're only growing at 6% and we want you growing at 20% and you're killing it on new business, uh, but your renewal rate is not good. Well, that's a big problem. That means that your product might need some help or you might be having the wrong person working on the job. And so we, what we're trying to do is get the least amount of numbers for people to look at so that they know where to spend their time in the most intelligent manner. I love that. That is so precise and there is nothing better than being able to see the data and actually yeah. be able to know where to start looking and, yeah. and for everybody listening like you, you don't realize the value of that but i want you to stop and think to yourself well gosh how many times have i seen there's an issue or a problem going on in the business and you didn't have the data and you didn't have the numbers to back it up to actually lead you down the path, right? It's sort of like yeah. having Sherlock Holmes in your pocket, right? <laughs> yeah. where, where it's looking at it and going, well, it's obvious you need to look here. And yeah. that's what you just described. And I, and I love that element of it. It's so valuable to have that data and to be able to have it simply put and simply organized in a way that you can get to it right away and then start using your creative genius that got you to the point where you're at in this business in the first place yeah. and using it to, yeah. to hone in on the right place. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's really uh, incredible. So talk to us a little bit about how we can take advantage of that and, and, and the stuff that you're doing at Ramsey. So first of all, you could get a free trial at RamseyInnovations.com for 30 days. So if you want to try out the software, you are welcome to do so. Uh, I also post, um, uh, almost every day on LinkedIn, like if you want to follow me, just different guidelines in terms of how to run your business more intelligently, more, mainly focus on the professional service space, but I think it's good information in general for you know any business owner. Uh, and those are probably the two predominant areas that we would recommend connecting with. Awesome. That's great. And what a what a great way to start off, guys. I mean, you can't get better than free to go try it out. So yeah, that's yeah. just silly if you don't go and do it. Uh, you guys listening, this is so important. And if I want to just sort of like ease some of your thoughts, because there might be those of you out there that are thinking, holy cow, he just like blew us up with numbers guys these are not <laughs> i don't want you to get too overly 
thought about this, right? Like, just don't overthink it. These are simple numbers. These are things that you need to know. This is stuff you've got to be doing in your business. This is a place where you've got to be. So just go try it out. They've made it simple. That's the goal. They, they've made yeah. it easy for you to use. And so go try it out and go check it out and see if it's something that uh, you can get moving forward with because you need this stuff and you need to have it so that you can continue to grow and do the things that you're doing to make the impact that you're trying to make uh, with with what you're doing. So I appreciate that so much. Uh, give, give us some wise words to head out the door with, uh, you know, and, and, and as we finish up, I want you to kind of put their mindset in the right place for the stuff we've yeah. been talking about today. A uh, few different sayings I have. One of my favorite is it can't be a goal unless you put budget against it. So, you know, a lot of times people tell me they want to grow faster and I'll ask them, well, how much do you spend on sales marketing? He's like, oh, I don't spend anything on sales marketing. So if you want to be more innovative, you got a budget to be innovative. If you right. want to grow faster, you need a budget to grow faster. And so, you know, my, my general uh, get away from like, oh, I'm just going to add it to my plate and do it myself. Right. Uh, if you're not willing to put at least a person on it, it probably isn't that important to you. Right. Man, that is so valuable. <laughs> Guys, just write that down <laughs> and, and yeah. just remember that today. All right, guys, this has been super fun. And thank you so much, John, for your wisdom and expertise today in this area. It is so helpful and it's stuff we all need to pay attention to and focus to. Until next time, keep choreographing your business and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Want more business choreography? Check out our website at bizchoreo.com to find out more. And find out how the choreography for your marketing operations and sales can raise your revenue and create more impact. Remember, every business needs choreography.